Grand Canyon is a big topic in many ways. Uh, references dealing with it. Here are just a few of those that we mentioned in the uh, information <coughs> announcement. Uh, <coughs> you Google uh, Grand Canyon geology, you get 18,000, excuse me, 28,000 uh, references. Uh, it's a topic. A lot has been written about the geology of the Grand Canyon, and it's uh, impossible to cover it all, of course. But uh, we're interested in it from a, a different aspect, and that is uh, how it relates to the biblical account of beginnings, in contrast to the scientific, put that word in quotes, account of beginnings. <coughs> scientific. Uh, approach of course suggests we're talking about billions of years for some of the layers there, well at least a billion, uh, 1.8 billion uh, for some of the layers versus uh, uh, talking about 6,000 years. Uh, <coughs> and the, the contrast is extreme and uh, here you have an example of what do you do with it. Uh, between these two world views, world views that are uh, uh, very significant to, to us. And so we're, we're going to uh, look at this. The uh, Grand Canyon is uh, a marvelous place, uh, no question. It's the number one geological show place of the world. Uh, it's not the deepest canyon there is in the world at all. Uh, you go in the Himalaya Mountains and uh, around uh, <coughs> India and Pakistan, the Indus River cuts through a canyon there. It's three times as deep as the Grand Canyon. Uh, but it does not have the beautiful exposure of geology that the Grand Canyon has. Uh, Grand Canyon uh, shows you so much of the uh, geology. It's such a uh, wonderful place to see what the inside of the earth, uh, at least in that region, uh, and so it, it's extremely popular. Uh, the, uh, the two questions we want to address here in this issue, and that is, one, were the rock layers of the Grandest Canyon, some people call it that, <coughs> laid down by the Genesis Flood? And uh, that's part of this issue. Or they lay down over billions of years, uh, most of the layers over hundreds of millions of years. <coughs> and we are going to address that question today. Now, a second and very intriguing question, uh, which we'll cover next week, is was the canyon carved by the astonishing Genesis flood? And the uh, receding waters of the flood uh, provide a, uh, a definite suggestion uh, of what might have carved that particular canyon. But what is the evidence for it? How do you fit it into the, the picture of the interpretation uh, that you know, it took you know, 70 million, uh, most, people, most scientists think now maybe five or six million years to cut uh, the Grand Canyon in contrast to us talking about it being cut uh, in a few years at most <coughs> as the uh, receding waters of the flood uh, parted from the earth. So that those are the two main questions we're going to address with today. We address just the first one. <coughs> now, uh, the Bible tells us uh, certain things about this astonishing event. Uh, the flood spends three chapters describing it. The Bible only spends two chapters describing creation, so you, th this is a significant event. <coughs> and uh, just a few little uh, selections from there. All the high hills under the whole heavens were covered. All flesh died that moved upon the earth. Uh, it sounds like it's a, what we call a universal event. In other words, it was worldwide. 
Uh, among the events, the Bible states, uh, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and the waters prevailed upon the earth and hundred and fifty days. Uh, this is much faster to understand than uh, these millions of years geologists propose. Um, <coughs> Uh, and then uh, after you have this, you have this, uh, and the waters prevailed. And how we wish we knew what that word prevail really means. Uh, there are many uh, different interpretations where some say, well, it means things, they stayed that way. Others say, no, uh, uh, they were still rising in terms of, in, with reference to the previous uh, <coughs> comments about, uh, at least there was a major storm at least for 40 days. And, there was something going on for 150 days. And um, then it's, at the end it says, and the waters return from off the earth continually. Uh, it's what most battle translators use. They use the word continually. Uh, but uh, marginal uh, references and so on and uh, concordances uh, refer to it. It's not just it's going and returning. I simply mention that. Not because of the Grand Canyon especially, but because it does provide a, uh, a suggestion that there were waves going back and forth. And of course, when you start thinking about some of our geological features like cyclothems and our, uh, some of our Cretaceous layers that are, seem to be cyclic and so on, uh, you think, hey, maybe there's something to this going and returning. But that's <coughs> Anyway, and after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated and so on. So, that's the, the general picture. We don't have time to go into the details of it, but uh, this is the biblical story. How does that fit into the Grand Canyon is what we're considering here. Uh, you don't have to go to the Bible for suggestions that the Grand Canyon uh, uh, was associated with a major flood. Uh, three Indian tribes that live around the, uh, that region Navajo, Hualapai, and Havazupai still believe that the river is the runoff from a great f flood that once covered the earth. Well, that, that's uh, interesting. Uh, they seem to associate uh, the Grand Canyon with, with a great flood, which is part of this dominant picture we have of, of uh, flood uh, literature uh, in the folk literature of the world. Well, uh, <coughs> just to make clear that you understand what we are talking about here, we're talking about <coughs> two different models in terms of the geologic column. At the left here, you've got your main parts of the geologic column. Uh, the Grand Canyon is mostly in the Paleozoic, some of them in the Proterozoic, uh, tan and brown and pink. Uh, parts that you see there. <coughs> Above the Grand Canyon, you got the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. But uh, <coughs> the big question is, are you going to follow the evolution model with the ages listed there in billions of years, uh, excuse me, millions of years? Or are you going to follow the creation model with the ages there uh, described uh, as direct years per se. And you can see uh, the difference, the time contrast is just tremendous between these two. Uh, this is millions to billions of years for the evolution model. We're talking about uh, the flood, mostly a one year event. So you, you can see the, the contrast is striking. It, uh, and this is, this is the, the question we're asking. Were those layers laid down during that one year event or were they laid down during these millions of years uh, for evolution and the uh, <coughs> uh, model versus the flood being the main part of the uh, geologic column uh, in that region? Well, uh, just a few little trivia about the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's considered the world's grandest natural architectural masterpiece. It's 277 miles long. That's following the river. 
<coughs> uh, you can't drive across it. Uh, if you want to drive around, you have to go by through Naval Bridge, 215 miles to get from the north rim to the south rim. But if you're a good walker or hiker, uh, 21 miles will get you down and back up. <coughs> uh, President Theodore Roosevelt, who set it aside, 1908 stated, do nothing to mar the grandeur. The Grand Canyon is the one great site which all Americans should see. And then, uh, keep in mind, not all agree. Some just call it a bad case of soil erosion. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Ives, uh, he's become famous. You find him in many books about the Grand Canyon because he made these statements. He said, uh, said uh, it can be approached only from the south. And after entering it, there's nothing to do but leave. Uh, ours has been and first and will doubtless be the last part of White, excuse me, the last party of Whites to visit this profitless locality. Well, he wasn't quite right. You know, <laughs> around five million visitors to the Grand Canyon, which is the second most popular canyon or, or national park, I should say, uh, in the United States. Uh, Smoky, Great Smoky Mountains uh, being number one, which has about twice as many visitors as the Grand Canyon. Uh, that is per se, but it, this is number two. So that's uh, a little bit of what, what we're uh, 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 talking about here. Uh, <coughs> when you look at the Grand Canyon, you're, you're struck by a number of things. You know, I, I remember the first time I saw it, I just could not believe it. I mean, th this was, oh, most, most wonderful thing. Such a huge. So you go and see it yourself. You, you, you can't be sure that it's, it's that big, but it's, it's, it's such a huge thing. Uh, and then you, you look, hey, uh, look at those layers. You look at the hey, man, look at those layers. Look how flat they are. Look how parallel they are. Look how you go across there. Man, uh, and uh, it's 277 miles long. Now, that's as the river crawls around, uh, really about 100 miles. Uh, as, a flow, as a crow flies, if a crow flies straight. And uh, then, then you ask, uh, where in the world is the river? Uh, and so on, the river, you can't see it so small, uh, but it's down in this crack right here, if you follow the arrow right through here, and goes on down over here and so on. Uh, river is very small, and you can raise the question, can a river that size cut? something that large. So on, we'll discuss that next week. Well, uh, just a brief overview of the Grand Canyon. <coughs> I presume most of you have been there, but uh, uh, some of the details may be of interest to you. This is the uh, location, the map of it. Uh, it's located in Arizona, as you may well know. <coughs> United States Post Office uh, printed 100 million stamps, 60 cent stamps, of the Grand Canyon. And they stated it was in Colorado. Why did they state it was in Colorado? Because uh, it's uh, cut by the Colorado River, at least assumed to be cut by the Colorado River. And you can see the Colorado River right here. And, and so it comes on through here. The Grand Canyon is this grayish uh, shaded area right here. And uh, it's, it's in Arizona. Well, uh, they, they fortunately caught that error before they distributed the stamps. So what do you do for 100 million stamps? Uh, uh, they become collector's items. So uh, this is, this is uh, where it is. Uh, several rivers contribute to it. The Green River being <coughs> further away from the canyon itself than the uh, <coughs> Colorado and so on comes out in the uh, Gulf of California. A little close up of the uh, canyon itself. Uh, uh, the interesting thing, or one of the interesting things about the canyon is that it's, 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 it's a high region compared to the surrounding territory or some, some of the landscape. And it's, 
it tends to uh, rise up here at this East Kaibab monocline. And uh, it's a high region through here. And it's, uh, uh, the end of the high region ends right here at the Grand Wash Cliffs. And we'll consider that uh, more of it. Uh, keep in mind, this is part of the oddity of the Grand Canyon uh, and something we'll discuss next week. Uh, carving of the canyon, uh, well, you don't know too much, but this is just a side canyon here, incidentally. Fault controlled by the Brand Angel Fault. Uh, but it's, it's not uh, where the river runs. Uh, the river's down in, in uh, this crack right here, right through here, and goes on over here behind these rocks in that direction. The Green Canyon can be quite wide in some places, 18 miles in this region. You can see the river uh, right here, uh, in this, right here is part of the river, here's some more of the river there in that region. It can be quite narrow, uh, some say one mile, it's more like four miles wide here in uh, this particular region. Uh, and uh, very important to our uh, interpretation here is the question that as you look at the fossils through these layers, uh, there's a major change. Where you see that red arrow there? It's called the Cambrian explosion. This is, uh, below that you have microscopic fossils, uh, very few of them. Above that, you have trilobites, crinoids, uh, clams, uh, other things, and so on. Uh, things become very abundant above that. So, uh, and the question is, do you put that region below in the flood, or do you stay with the region above? Well, uh, our creationists vary according to their different interpretations as to uh, whether they would do that or not. We're going to approach this from the standpoint that uh, the flood is the one that deposits the horizontal layers. The layers before uh, were there before the flood. Uh, we won't take time to discuss the details of that, but uh, that's the approach uh, <coughs> uh, we're using. Many creationists feel that way about it, and many feel differently about it. Uh, but getting into the geologic column, just to orient you a little bit, uh, the Grand Canyon only covers a uh, fairly small part. It covers from here, this red block mainly is the Grand Canyon. And uh, some of the deeper layers are below here in the Proterozoic period. So it covers this part. And uh, in fact, there are no horizontal division or solid layers in the Grand Canyon. Uh, so th that's where it is, and there are many layers above it. Uh, which we'll consider next week. Cross section of the Grand Canyon tells you a little bit about uh, that situation, which is uh, fascinating. Uh, these brown layers are uh, what were in that uh, red uh, block we showed you. Uh, uh, this is the Paleozoic uh, sediments, as you can see here. Uh, and they rise up here and so on come to a brief uh, end here at the, the uh, Grand Rocks Cliffs due to a fault. Uh, the river itself starts here uh, a little beyond, I mean, the canyon itself starts a little beyond Glen Canyon Dam at Lee's Ferry right there. And uh, you can see the level of the river all through here. Uh, and it comes down here. It's, it's about 3,000 feet over here and about 1,000 feet over here uh, at Hoover Dam Lake Mead area. But the, the river, of course, flows down from this 3,000 uh, along this blue line that you see right there. Uh, uh, and you have very high regions here, and this is, of course, the most dramatic part of the Grand Canyon is right here where, where layers are the highest. When you're looking at it from a, uh, th that was an east-west uh, view, from a north-south uh, perspective, uh, the, the Grand Canyon, as you can see, is right here. And uh, vertical exaggeration is 15, 
x. In other words, uh, it's 15 times as wide as it seems to be here. And uh, these are your Paleozoic sediments, your Mesozoic sediments here, and uh, Cenozoic sediments here, and so on, uh, above it. Now, interestingly, there is a significant series of Precambrian sediments in the Grand Canyon, and that, that's this uh, brownish region uh, right here. And uh, uh, we'll show you a picture of those things. Uh, some creationists put those layers into the flood, some don't. <clears throat> Here are a picture that shows you some of those uh, Precambrian sediments. Uh, everything below this ridge that you see right here that I'm pointing out by the, everything below that is Precambrian. Those are those Precambrian sediments. Very few fossils, microscopic fossils. Uh, then all of a sudden, you get into animals you're more familiar with, like uh, trilobites. Maybe you're not very that familiar with trilobites, but anyway. Uh, starfishes, clam sponges, and so on. Uh, so that, that's, uh, and uh, we're approaching this from the standpoint that floods started at this particular uh, level, per se. This was material that was there before uh, the worldwide flood in the primitive earth. Uh, going down the river uh, along uh, uh, the river, you can see it right there, uh, river, muddy river incidentally. As they say, it's, it's too thick to drink and too thin to plow. Uh, but you, you get into some other Precambrian sediments. These are the, these things below those sedimentary layers. Uh, to the left here is the uh, uh, Vishnu schist, uh, metamorphosed rocks, uh, and the, the middle whitish region you see there is uh, what they call Zoroaster granite. It's uh, intrusion of granite. Granite has been pushed up among those layers, and we would say this stuff that occurred before. Uh, the flood. Uh, going through the river in the bottoms is a different experience than, than at the top. Uh, fairly small river, actually, and fairly narrow canyons in certain regions, wide in others. Uh, I want to point out to you something especially important here, and that is these dark layers that you see, or rocks that you see right here, the volcanic. Uh, in the western part of the Grand Canyon, there's been a lot of volcanic activity, and those lava flows have come down, and some of them come down to the river, and they're making stories about how they plugged up the river and so on, and geologists disagree uh, considerably as to uh, how effective those dams were, how old the dams are, and so on. But uh, interesting that we had that uh, volcanic activity there. Uh, this is a, a cave in the Red Wall, uh, as you go along the <coughs> river, uh, you see some people to the right there for scale. Uh, a huge cave, uh, probably cut out in, in part by the action of the, the river at a, when it was at a higher level. <coughs> uh, fall, uh, Deer Falls, uh, Deer Creek, uh, and so on. Not too many of these, but uh, there are some, some uh, falls. On. Uh, erosion can be very vertical. As you can see here from this uh, picture, uh, cutting way down through these layers. Uh, there's a side canyon. Uh, there are many, many, many side canyons in the Grand Canyon. And I will say more about those next week. And uh, here's traveling down the, the river. You can see a, a raft right here, and part of the raft right here, and so on. Uh, uh, there are 70 rapids that you have to go through when you go through the Grand Canyon when you're on a raft, and uh, it's hard to keep dry in any of them. Uh, beautiful scenery, river down at the bottom of the picture, as you can see here, various layers, and uh, you have a pretty, pretty complete geological column right here, and then from this, uh, this Chuar Butte here happens to be right near where the 
the little Colorado River comes into the Colorado River. Uh, so that, that's just a little bit of a general view about it. one of the points I want to make today is that we have incredibly widespread layers. Uh, the, uh, uh, for instance, the top layer in the Grand Canyon, the one you walk on when you're up there at the rim looking around and so on, is the Kaibab. Uh, it's also found in California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico. These are, these are uh, widespread layers, folks. Uh, for that thin layer that you find up there on the top and so on, spread over several states. Uh, it's one of the more widespread ones, I might say. Uh, but uh, you look at the present topography of the Earth. Things go up and down all over the place. There's no way you could deposit these layers on that kind of a continent at, at present because uh, you have to continue this flat layer to lay down these tremendously widespread layers, which uh, fits much better with the idea of a flood than otherwise. Uh, here's what uh, Clarence Dutton, a very famous geologist, uh, Early work on this, this is a geological survey monograph number two. Uh, what he says when he describing the Grand Canyon uh, when he was there. This is way back in uh, 1882. He said, the strata of each and every age were remarkably uniform over very large areas and were deposited very nearly horizontally. I mean, it's, you're struck by this when you see the Grand Canyon, of course. Nowhere have we found thus far what may be called local depositions such as are restricted to a narrow belt or contracted area. Well, of course, this was 1882. Uh, uh, we have found, of course, that there is some local stuff. We will get into that in just a little bit. Uh, but uh, it's not very abundant, not very abundant. And uh, this basic uh, uh, view is, uh, I think, striking and important when you consider about it. Was this a flood event? Or was this something that uh, took millions of years? So, remember that? The strata of each and every were remarkably uniform and o over very large areas were, and were deposited nearly horizontally. Well, water usually deposits material horizontally. That's no special news. <coughs> Let's get to, to, the, uh, to the layers uh, themselves. You have here uh, names for, for these various layers. And uh, just go through briefly a little bit what the standard geological interpretation for these various layers is. <coughs> You've got <coughs> at the top the, the Kaibab layer. This is a limestone. This is supposed to be a uh, below wave type of marine deposit. In other words, it's a big shelf. It's supposed to be a shelf. You know, this is a tremendous shelf, you must understand. It runs into several states. Uh, <coughs> marine shelf, uh, below wave level, and so on. And you, you find marine organisms in that particular layer. <coughs> uh, but it's extremely flat for such a widespread area. I mean, uh, it's good. Kaibab, you know, it's probably, I don't know, 300 feet thick there. <coughs> Thickness varies a little bit from place to place. But right below it, you've got the Toro Weep. <coughs> and that layer is uh, more sandy. It's interpreted to represent partly dunes, partly marine material. Uh, <coughs> not as widespread as the Kaibab. Then below it, you got the most striking layer, the, the whitish layer. You can see it all the way across the thing, the Coconino. Notice how flat it is on top. Notice how flat it is below. Uh, this is supposed to be dune. Dune deposit. Uh, it's all over the Grand Canyon. 
uh, thinner in the uh, western Grand Canyon, but it's a very flat type of layer. Uh, how do you flatten dunes out to get, the, notice how thin that Toro weave right above it, you know, I, things are so extremely, extremely, let me show, show you right here. Uh, see that little thin layer of Toro weave right above it? Just go on. Things were extremely flat, not according to normal topography that we see now on the earth and so on. But, uh, dune. Hermit. Uh, most popular interpretation of the hermit is that it's a river deposit. And so you got a river. Uh, this thing runs, oh, 30,000 square miles, a hermit, uh, which is three times the size of the Grand Canyon, <coughs> at least twice the size of the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's supposed to be deposited by rivers, you know. But a little hard to imagine rivers over 30,000 square miles. Uh, and we don't have very good analogs uh, for that. Uh, and there's this not complete agreement among geologists exactly. So, uh, is it all river and so on? Uh, they, some agree it's difficult to make that uh, just a river. But it's that reddish layer just below the cooking, you know, goes all the way across the Grand Canyon and more. <laughs> uh, then we've got the supai. Uh, supai actually has, that's a group. It's actually four different uh, <laughs> formations. I didn't uh, take time to put all four of the, the names on it. But uh, the, the top layer is the esplanade, called the esplanade. It's a sandstone layer. Uh, you can see it right, right here, for instance, the esplanade and so on. Uh, this is interpreted uh, as, again, we're, we're back into a dune interpretation uh, for this. And as you go on down through the other layers, uh, I won't bother to name them right now for you, uh, you get more and more marine material here uh, in these various layers the three others that are there. And then you come to this red wall, which is perhaps the, the most distinctive layer, uh, aside from the Coconino, uh, that you find in the Grand Canyon. We look at the Grand uh, Look for that red wall. That, that's the way you can orient yourself on these layers when you are looking at it. Cause it's, and it uh, tends to be redder simply because it's stained by the red layers above it. Uh, but it is a, supposed to be a, a shelf, a marine shelf. Uh, covers the top half of northern Arizona and uh, spread all over, you know, the, the 100 miles here, as you can see, as you uh, course through the, through the river, uh, lo looking uh, up at the various layers. Below that, we got the Temple Butte. And this one uh, phases out in the uh, eastern part of the Grand Canyon where we are here. To, uh, it's likely right there where I pointed it, but uh, unless you climb there, you can look at it carefully. It's very hard to tell uh, that you have it and so on. So, uh, but it, it's, it's the Temple of Butte. Uh, how it's formed, uh, not well understood. It's, it's a lot of fine layers. Uh, and uh, it appears to be uh, marine. And a lot of geologists say, well, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, probably subtitle, title, intertidal uh, type of thing, anyway, uh, associated with uh, close to the shore thing. And uh, that one runs from here. It, it gets more abundant. You go further east. It gets more abundant if you go further west. Uh, but in this region here, it's not, not as, uh, it comes in channels a little bit, which is a little different than what Dutton thought. Of course, when he looked at it first, he hadn't got studied all the details and so on. Uh, then below that, you've got the Muav. That's a, a limestone unit supposed to have been deposited in the ocean. Uh, below that, you got the Bright Angel Shale, which is a, uh, fine grain, uh, shaley type of sediment, supposed to be deposited close to the coast. And below that, you got the tapeats, which is supposed to have been deposited 
at the coast itself. Uh, we'll say more about those in just a minute. And then below that, you got that Precambrian, which in some places is all this granite. Other places, it's uh, those sediments that I was telling you about, uh, that we, we showed you, that uh, have very few fossils in them. Uh, well, uh, you go 100 miles to the west, and you got the Grand Canyon there still. This is uh, your Colorado River. It's right down here at, at, at the bottom, right here. Uh, you can see it right here. And you got, you know, the same layers. Kaibab up there, Torwe, Coconino, Hermit. Hermit much thicker here. Uh, Supai, uh, four different parts. Red Wall right here. Temple Butte uh, <coughs> right here. Very well uh, displayed right here. Uh, Grand Wash. Not a, uh, an official uh, formation, but it, uh, where they've named, it's that whitish layer that you see right there behind the name. Muav, uh, we already talked to you about that. Uh, more deep ocean, open ocean, uh, uh, bright angel, close, and so on. Uh, Tapetes might be here at the bottom, but the, if you follow, the, just go around the curve here on, the, on this uh, uh, river here and so on, you do find the tapetes down there uh, at the bottom be below those various layers. So that, that's the, the general picture, the general geologic interpretation of the Grand Canyon is that we have all these different kinds of uh, environments uh, represented there in these very widespread, very flat type of environments. Well, uh, <laughs> paleo environments. I uh, appreciated the candor of one of my teachers, my sedimentology professor uh, over at UCR. He, he just made the quip, uh, almost unrelated. He said, well, he says, all paleo environments below the tertiary are a thigma of the imagination. I, uh, I thought, it was, well, what an interesting statement. Uh, in other words, it's hard to determine what the environment was like. I've been telling you about these various environments as, as the way uh, geologists feel about them. And uh, they, they uh, are aware that uh, it's to a certain extent a guessing game. Paleo environments, to a certain extent, is where uh, uh, witchcraft and geology intersect. And you have to... Uh, Keep in mind, this is tentative stuff. They know it, but uh, theologians and newspaper reporters don't. When they hear something, they say, oh, this is this, this is this. Uh, you get into the scientific literature, you don't get the rigor that you pick up in newspapers. Uh, I should say, some theologians, uh, there are different kinds of theologians, but, uh, <coughs> For the Grand Canyon, it seems to me that if you look at this, for deposition over the long ages, those layers are too flat, they're too thin, they're too widespread, and there are too many. I mean, this is a long period of time you're talking about here. You're talking about almost 300 million years, they think, for this, and things just seem to be so stable there, you got to change environments from marine to desert to rivers to so on, uh, which would involve tectonic activity likely. And so uh, what, uh, it's hard to put that picture together in terms of, uh, but it, it's, it's more what you might expect uh, possibly with a uh, events during the flood. And uh, this geologist Brett. He expresses my concerns here very much so. Uh, Brett does not believe in, in uh, the flood, uh, at least not the biblical flood, uh, as we interpret it here. And he states, beds may persist over areas of many hundreds to thousands of square kilometers precisely because they are the record of truly oversized events. This is just what I'm talking about. <clears throat> the accumulation of the preeminent stratigraphic record in many cases 
involves processes that have not been or cannot be observed in modern environments. Hey, the past is different. <clears throat> there are the extreme events with magnitudes so large and devastating that they have not and probably could not be observed scientifically. You see, I would also argue that many successions show far more lateral continuity and similarity at a far finer scale than would be anticipated by most geologists. So you get the, the picture here. Things are different out there than you see going on right now. And they're different in a way that fits with what you'd expect uh, during a, a major catastrophe like the Genesis Flood. Uh, just to point out how, a suggestion how this might happen, this is a, a model for the flood. We don't know what happened exactly the flood. Uh, but you see, this gives you something to talk about. Uh, and uh, you notice uh, ver various environments at different levels than the pre-flood. During the flood, uh, those environments were washed into these large depositional basins like you have right here. Uh, this arrow shows the material come from the ocean. This arrow shows the material come on top, coming from on top, the continents and so on. And so you have a mixture of these various environments, some of the from the ocean, some from the land, into this one basin. And then, of course, you uh, erode all, at the end of the flood, the continents rise back up again. During the flood, they're all covered with water. Uh, rise up again, and you have uh, uh, things like the Grand Canyon uh, showing up, cutting through those various layers. So just a suggestion of, of what might be involved here. Uh, th this uh, question of lateral continuity and the thinness uh, gets quite interesting when you look at some of the details. Uh, we've already mentioned to you that uh, the Supai group had uh, four different formations in it. We've also uh, uh, mentioned that uh, the red wall <coughs> was that big layer in the middle. The red wall has four different members as the formation. And the, uh, the thing that is, astound is astounding to me, and I, still, I can hardly believe, I still wonder if this is correct. But uh, McKee uh, and Guchek, McKee is probably one of the leading, uh, if not the leading uh, researcher in the Grand Kenya, at least he was in the last century. Uh, and Guchek was at the University of Notre Dame and so on. They wrote this very famous monograph on the uh, Red Canyon, on the Red Wall, sorry. And uh, divided the whole red wall into four different members. And they claim they are consistent throughout that whole canyon, I mean, from one end to the other, four different divisions. So that uh, when, when you're looking at the, at the red wall, and you can see it right here, and I'll point out right here, like it's, it's this steep cliff that you have right here. So on goes on through here. It's divided into four divisions one on top of the other, across the whole canyon for 100 miles. You must have had a flat area there for 100 miles, less than 100 feet of topography uh, for many of these layers. How is that possible? This is an incredibly flat uh, area. I mean, uh, you know, 100 miles, uh, this is a lot further than going from here to Los Angeles. Uh, and you got this extremely flat. Then you have, m over millions of years, another layer laid on top of it. And then over millions of years, another layer laid on top of it. Just all forming this solid uh, red wall here. And uh, I have a hard time thinking even that could happen could it catastrophically in a flood. But certainly it's more likely in a flood than under normal conditions where uh, you expect, well, this is supposed to be shallow marine material. Uh, I've, I've lived, uh, you know, in this area and so on. Uh, these things are not flat, these environments. Uh, certainly not for 100 miles. But, uh, well, uh, 
another interesting sidelight. Uh, I uh, <coughs> don't want to take too much time on this. Just to tell you a little bit how uh, uh, geological thinking is. Uh, uh, the three bottom layers I mentioned to you are called the uh, Tonto Group. And right above them, you got the Tonto Platform. Uh, I shouldn't say above them. Uh, in the middle of them, you got the Tonto Platform. But uh, this Tonto Group, uh, they're all Cambrian. The top one's the Moab Limestone. The next one, Bright Angel Shale, and the next one, the Tapit Sandstone, just to show you some pictures of them here. Here, uh, right here, is the uh, Tonto Group. Uh, this is the uh, Tapits right here. This is the Bright Angel Shale. And uh, this is the Moab right here. And, uh, uh, Temple Butte and Red Wall right there and so on. Uh, but these three units are interpreted by geologists in a different way than they usually interpret it. They, they call it transgressive time deposition. And it's an interesting uh, uh, picture. Uh, same, same series right here. This is uh, in the western end of the Grand Canyon near Las Vegas. Uh, not that close to Las Vegas. But anyway, here, here's your Tapits. Here's your Bright Angel. And your uh, Moab is quite thick, clear on up to here, uh, to this whitish region right here. Uh, then you got Temple Butte and Red Wall. Here's your Red Wall right there. Uh, anyway, uh, they think that these were laid down not as a unit one on top of the other. They were laid down kind of at an angle transgressively over 20 million years. And they kept this tripartite organization as this happened. Uh, and here's a diagram telling you how it happened. It's supposed to have happened from west to east. Uh, and uh, these black lines tell you various times. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the, the lower black line uh, here is uh, <coughs> an early time. Later on, it was like this. That was the surface. And later on, like this. So on. And uh, this progressed to the east as the shoreline kept moving towards the east, uh, going higher and higher. And so this means that the Tapits, for instance, uh, would be very young here and very old here, 20 million years older. And so on. This is what you call time transgressive deposition. The problem I have with that is how in the world are you going to keep three different environments, let's say just two anyway. Uh, the distinction between the, the Moab and the uh, Bright Angel Shale, that's the, the purple here and there, uh, that line is not uh, very even and so on. That, that you can argue some about that one. Uh, the tapits, uh, I don't know how you're going to keep that tapits at that same level for 20 million years as you're laying it down gradually at an angle. You'd expect a, st a storm to dump that stuff out further out and so on. You'd expect considerable mixing. Now the, the line is, uh, break, break between the tapits and the bright angel shell is not all that sharp. Uh, I'll admit to that. But man, 20 million years, and you still have that uh, sharp uh, uh, line at the top of the tapits. Uh, here, here's the tapits right here in, in this picture. You can see it right there, all the way through. And keep on it. You see it? All the way there. How are you going to get a layer? Just constantly. All you need is a great big storm to throw some stuff out further and so on to, to push it up into the uh, area of the bright angel shale is being uh, deposited and so on. Uh, here's your tapits uh, over here. Uh, if I can get this oh. right here. You can see the tapits right here. No, they got a fairly sharp top to it, you know. 
this doesn't this doesn't fit with uh, what I expect from the long ages model at all. Uh, more so, what I expect something was laid down, you know, catastrophically uh, during the flood. And here, here's a close-up of the tapich. Uh, right here, you've got a person for scale. Uh, this is all that pre-Cambrian material, uh, you know, schists and so on. And this is where the tapich begins. Uh, look at this thing here. Uh, you see how these layers were pushed up like this? Obviously, there's been some, some catastrophic activity there and so on. The upper part of the tapich is a little finer, which fits with the uh, evolutionary model, the evolutionary model, uh, per se. But still, how did that stay there? And it didn't, uh, the, the top of the tapich is way too flat to, to fit into uh, what you'd expect normal uh, variation in geological activity over 20 million years. Is that an example of soft sediment deformation? Uh, yes, yes, uh, I, I think so. Uh, we need to be careful in soft sediment deformation. Well, we won't go into that right now. Uh, uh, here's uh, McKean Ressler. The classic, the classic paper on this uh, tripartite uh, division here. I'm speaking the Tapitz uh, bright angel shale Moab, Is uh, McKean Ressler. 1945 and so on and so on. They talk about some layers in that Moab that are really quite widespread and thin. Uh, and uh, I might say some of them are in the direction that you'd expect from this angular deposit to a certain extent. Uh, a couple of them, they can tell by the fossils and so on. Uh, so that data helps them a little bit, uh, but uh, hard to believe such widespread flat environments. Uh, talking about various conglomerates, uh, I'm not going to go through all this. This is in the, the uh, Moab. Uh, he, he said the conglomerate layers are only a few inches thick. These are conglomerate layers. A zone of several feet. The maximum lateral extent of the zone is 55 miles. This is, you know, just a few feet, a layer just running for 55 miles. I mean, this will get you almost to Los Angeles, folks, from here. Uh, if you can imagine a layer just, I mean, this is incredibly flat topography. Uh, go on from it. Uh, it's talking about another layer, again, in that same unit. Uh, it is a fine-grained reddish-gray sandstone, only a few feet thick which extends from Grand Wash Cliffs eastward at least 35 miles to the vicinity of Granite Park. I'll show that to you in a second. Uh, in, in that paper, they give 17 widespread key markers inside that thing, extremely thin, white, uh, widespread layers. That's not what's going on, there, on the Earth at present, uh, uh, at least not in, in, in uh, normal shoreline environments. Uh, type of thing. Well, uh, and so uh, and he talks about 30 to 95 miles for, for these for these marker layers here. Yeah, incredibly thin stuff, uh, incredibly widespread. Uh, that one they were talking about 35 miles from the Grand Wash Cliffs. Here are the Grand Wash Cliffs. Uh, talk about Granite Park. Granite Park is right here. Uh, so they have this one marker layer all the way across that way, you know, j just a few feet thick. Uh, th this is what's out there. This fits so much better with catastrophic flood than it would with present things. Well, uh, the uh, <coughs> question of cars in the red wall. The uh, That's basically caves, right? Yeah, karst is where you have irregular limestone erosion. It's a German word. Uh, and, uh, you know, limestone is quite soluble. Houses fall into limestone holes sometimes and so on. They've been dissolved and so on. And when you've got karst, it takes time to for dissolve limestone. It's not done instantly during a year during the flood. And this is probably the favorite argument posed against the flood model for uh, the Grand Canyon. 
the uh, here's the red wall. You see right here, and on the top of the red wall, you've got this karst. Well, uh, follow this carefully. This is not the red wall. Uh, this is the uh, in Texas, uh, and uh, you've you got some limestone layers here. Uh, Notice this thin limestone layer above this hole that's been dissolved out. Was the hole there before the limestone layer lay down? You say immediately, no. Limestone layer would not be laid across that. Well, uh, so layer must have been laid down first, and then we had this after. Now, if it takes place after, you don't have to do it during the flood, you understand. So we go, go to, to the Grand Canyon. You've got the red wall, which is represented by the ten, light ten layers there. And you've got above it uh, the uh, Watamohegi Formation. Uh, that's part of that Supai group. Uh, they would say, uh, sir, we lay down the red wall. Over years, you dissolve these holes, and then later you fill them up. Now, the short age model would be, hey, uh, you don't have to take years to do this. You can do it after the flood, long after it. Uh, so down here you have the red wall. The Watamohegi is laid down right after it. You've got this hole right here, and then you've got uh, something very funny here. He blocks Watamohegi right here. Hey, if there were blocks, Watamohegi must have been hard. If the Watamohegi was hard, this must have been long after the original karst deposit, not the filling in with uh, soft sediments as you have in this model right here. And you, you look in uh, the Grand Canyon, and you find this is one of these holes. This is the red wall. This is the Watamohegi. Notice these blocks in there. Watamohegi was hard when this happened. Karst occurred after the flood. This is not a chine challenge to the karst. Uh, just a closer picture of that here and so on. Uh, you see these hard layers into that, into that uh, karst uh, pocket in the red wall. Uh, and uh, here's what one geologist, after studying this uh, in the Madison, especially Amsden form, these are up in Wyoming uh, layers, but same layers, uh, not the same name. Uh, Madison is considered parallel to the red wall, but that's an aside. Here's what he said. He said, hey, that's all stuff that occurred after after, and it doesn't pose a time challenge to the flood. It says, in my opinion, the late Mississippi and Karst story in the Rocky Mountains is completely fallacious. Now, so we've looked at an ample too. I can't tell you for sure all cars is like that at all. Grand Canyon, I've looked at him, looked at all the cars and so on. Uh, but there is a strong suggestion that this cars picture is not all that much of a challenge. And then uh, you have ancient. Uh, uh, channels in the Grand Canyon. Uh, at the top of the red wall, you've got some channels. Surprise Canyon, I just want to point out. Uh, some people say, that, well, man, you got a river channel here. This is going to take a lot of time. Folks, during the flood, please, you'd have all kinds of channels. Water sloshing around all over the place, uh, things going up and down, different sources of water uh, as tectonic changes take place and so on. Uh, channels are not a challenge to the flood. Uh, flood produces channels. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Coconino Sandstone, Hermit Shale Contact. Uh, that's the Coconino Sandstone up there at the end of that red arrow and so on. You look at it, you've got uh, tracks. Animals, uh, Leonard Brand has done some work on this. And as you demonstrated, you know, that they probably laid down in moist or wet. Uh, sand per se, and uh, this is into the literature, it, uh, a significant piece uh, suggesting, hey, that was not a desert. 
uh, type of thing. Well, it's just a, a suggestion. But uh, go to Sedona, Arizona. You've got uh, some layers there that you see. The bottom layer you see is the hermit shale. We've talked about that. You got next higher up, you got the Schnebly Hill. That's the orange one, dark orange one that you see across the picture. And above it, you got the Coconino. Now remember that Schnebly Hill. Go to the Grand Canyon. What do you got? You got the reddish hermit, dark reddish hermit there. And you got the Coconino. No Schnebly Hill between. Hey, it's missing. Schnebly Hill is supposed to have taken six million years to be laid down. So there is six million years, according to the Jack time scale, between the Schnebly Hill, I mean, sorry, between the Hermit and the Coconino. And you ask yourself the question, and you should, well, now, if at the bottom of the Coconino, uh, right here, we have six million years. Why is that Hermit shale so flat? And this leads you into uh, the, uh, one of my uh, favorite arguments. Uh, which I consider fairly too challenging these geologic time scales, and that is the, the lack of erosion at where we have parts of the geologic column missing. And there you've got six million years missing, and the thing is very flat, and you've got cracks in it. Uh, this is uh, Coconino. Uh, this is Hermit Shale. You've got a crack right here. Uh, and so uh, those who believe in long years, Cracks, oh, you got cracks in the hermit shale. How are you going to get cracks? They have to dry out. Hermit shale had to dry out for these cracks. That took time. How can you have drying out during the flood? Uh, these people have not heard of the process of cineresis, where colloids extrude water, and, uh, and especially one mineral in their hematite will form a colloid, extrude water, and form cracks underwater. It all occurs underwater. So it's not a good challenge at all. Some think, well, Coconino injected into it, but certainly not six million years uh, between that layer up there and this one and so on. This is just a close-up of the same thing here. We got to move on and so on. The, the longevity, they'd say, well, six million years. How are those cracks going to stay open for six million years and not fill up? if you want to follow that model. This doesn't seem possible. Coconino was laid down rapidly. This is it right here. Uh, on top of the uh, uh, hermit shale. And you've got the cracks there uh, that formed all underwater after the deposition uh, of both of them, still while they were soft. Uh, Expected erosion at the six meter gap between the Temple Butte and the Coconino, one would expect some 600 feet of vertical erosion, but the contact is very flat. Uh, and that, that's a corrected figure for agriculture, which should have. Just in closing, more gaps uh, in the Grand Canyon. Uh, you've got a lot of gaps in the Grand Canyon. I'll just mention two others. Uh, but uh, this illustrates what goes on here. When you have other layers in other parts of the world, uh, such as this brown layer we have here, which you might say is the Schnebly Hills, you'd expect a lot of erosion uh, during the time that was laid down. When you find a very flat layer like this in six million years to lay this down, you say, well, no, there's six million years between this layer and that layer. should not be flat. Uh, I've shown you this uh, slide many times, but this is the present surface of the Earth, the lines that you see right here. Look how flat these various layers are and so on. Uh, this is your red wall right here, Coconino right here and so on, uh, Moab down here and so on. Tremendous gap here. Uh, look at the Grand Canyon. Two, two of these, 14 million years right here in the middle of the uh, Supai group. Uh, between the uh, West Kogami and uh, Manakata. And uh, 100 million years here, during 100 million years, 
you'd expect 3,000 meters, you'd expect at least two, two uh, miles of erosion. The whole canyon's only a mile deep. Uh, if you sit there for 100 million years, uh, you'd expect something. That's right at the, the, the gaps right there at the bottom of the red wall, at the top of the, of the uh, uh, Moab. Make sure I get this straight. Uh, that's in the eastern Grand. You go to the western Grand Canyon, you got the same thing. Here's your uh, six million year gap, still up there, you know. That's 100 miles away. Uh, 100, 100 million years right there at the top of that uh, whitish layer. Uh, wish we could go into details about uh, uh, some of these, but we, we don't uh, have time to do it. So, uh, geologists recognize it as a puzzle here and so on. Uh, this is uh, uh, from uh, Blake, contrary to the implications of McKee's work, location of the boundary between the Manicacha and the Wetzelgami formation can be difficult to determine both from a distance and a close range. That's 14 million years there, and you can't find the gap. That's in the middle of the Supai. That's in the middle of the Supai, yes. Uh, down there at the top of the uh, Bright Angel Shale and so on, uh, Temple Butte, you need to keep that one straight. That this is a, uh, he's talking about the Temple Butte here. That's the one that's not all over the whole Grand Canyon, has channels in some part. Uh, it says, in parts of the Grand Canyon, including the type section on Temple Butte, where the channels are absent, Cambrian, the Devonian strata appear in local exposures to be without angular discordances, and the contact is planar with gray dolomite beds, so on and below above. Here, the unconformity, even though representing more than 100 million years, may be difficult to locate. And uh, you go to the Western Grand Canyon, you got the same thing. Here's that 100 million year gap right there. Uh, right at the top of this whitish layer all the way through there. You have to be careful where you fall. It's right there, all the way through there. Going up a side canyon. Here, more closely, right at the end of that arrow, that little line you see right there. That's the bottom of the Temple Butte, right there. 100 million years, uh, at least. And. Uh, but lies flat. I mean, this is this is a serious challenge to uh, the long ages. Do have some channels of that Temple Butte, and this mass that you see right here is a channel of Temple Butte. This is red wall here. But where you don't have any Temple Butte, you don't have a hundred million years. You got a hundred and fifty million years, and this is right across from where that last picture was taken. Uh, this is the Red Wall. This is the Moav, 150 million years. You'd expect at least three miles of erosion there. It's still there lying flat. Uh, serious challenge to the long geologic ages, one that is not discussed very much in literature except recognized, as I mentioned from those quotations that we had right there. So uh, in, in concluding, uh, let's just summarize briefly what we've gone through here. This the various formations of the Grand Canyon represent very widespread, very flat depositional environments. This is more as to be expected for the Genesis flood than for slow geologic processes over millions of years. Within these formations, one finds extremely widespread flat layers. It would not be possible to lay down such extremely flat layers on the irregular topography of our present continents over such a long period of time. Uh, you have to put in the time period. Continents are supposed to move up and down, move around and so on during these long ages. Where major gaps occur between these widespread layers, one does not find the effects of the long geologic ages proposed for these gaps. This indicates rapid deposition. You don't have that erosion you expect over those long ages and so on. So these factors authenticate the Genesis flood and a short time for the deposition of most of the sedimentary layers. There is significant scientific data that supports the biblical model of origins. You have a choice. You have a choice in terms of the data you want to follow here in this case. We're dealing with historical science here, uh, but it's gratifying to know that, hey, there is that data that tells us that, hey, the, the Bible is true. The Bible is true. Well, thank you for your attention. God bless you. Thank you.
Yes, we have the lights on. It's been a little past um, uh, mm -hmm. 11.30, uh, but for those of you who want to stay and ask questions, why we'll entertain them until Dr. Roth uh, uh, decides to quit. So we'll give the get first out. question <coughs> to uh, Tell him more now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Airy, for this wonderful presentation, especially the pictures. Those are very impressive. Uh, I've seen pictures of uh, Grand Canyon, but did you take all those pictures yourself? Yeah, yeah this is all. I okay. think I think everyone. Yeah. So okay. Now I have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is, you mentioned that uh, some evolutionists suggest that uh, those sediments were deposited by uh, rivers. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding is that rivers uh, are usually found on dry ground. Mm -hmm. So how do they explain the presence of marine sediments on uh, that were deposited by rivers on dry ground. Yeah. How did those, uh, I mean, those sediments got from the ocean to the rivers and then onto gr dry ground? Yeah. First, let me mention, they, the way they changed from a marine environment to a continental environment or land environment and so on is by raising the continents, putting them back down and so on. And you went to mountains, they talk about raising and lowering the uh, level about 12 times below the ocean, <laughs> above and so on. Uh, so, but that getting to, to your question about uh, rivers underwater, uh, marine, submarine rivers do exist uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, for instance. You've got these big plains out there. And in these big plains, uh, that are flat, you find rivers, uh, channels, uh, some of them 600 feet deep, some of them um, two, two to three miles wide, and they run for hundreds of miles. How are they formed under there? Uh, one explanation is turbidity currents. These are mud flows. Uh, that is more denser than the seawater, comes down and it flows through there and it digs that channel. So we do have underwater rivers per se. Besides that, I might say, in, uh, just go off the coast of California here around Monterey Bay, you got the Monterey Canyon. Folks, the Monterey Submarine Canyon, which is a canyon in the continental shelf, is just as big as the Grand Canyon. I mean, it's about a mile deep about 10 miles wide on average, so on. I mean, it's, it's uh, interesting to see cross sections of the Grand Canyon, cross sections of the Monterey Canyon. They're both the same size. Uh, it, uh, so uh, th this, 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 can, this can occur. The uh, uh, Hermit Shale, which is the one favorite one for river deposits here in the layers of the Grand Canyon, uh, they think there are some rivers involved in the tapetes occasionally and so on. But uh, Hermit Shale uh, has the, the widespread nature of that thing is, is what the problem is, I think. It, you, you do have rivers, you have deltas that can form if, it, if it's going into the ocean type of thing, which are, are quite wide at times. But usually rivers tend to stay in a fairly flat region. So it, it's just you know unusual to have it for 30,000 square miles. Okay, my follow-up uh, question is, so do they, are they suggesting that all those layers were formed underwater and then the land was elevated by tectonic activity or whatever and without too much bending because uh, you showed flat flat sediments, uh, uh, if, if tectonic activity elevated all that land from under mm -hmm. the, the ocean, 
then that means that there should have been a lot of bending. Why is it so flat? No, th this is a major challenge, I think, to them. Uh, but uh, let me clarify here. Your, your first point, you say, uh, do they think it was all underwater and so on? Uh, no. Whenever you get into, say, uh, well, so, some, some of the top parts, like the uh, Manacacha, I think, uh, so on. They, they find some plant fossils there and so on. They assume, no, it was above ground, then they move it back down. Uh, and then the Nucoconino, it's a desert, that's got to be above water. Uh, but then you get to the Kaibab, it's marine, you've got to move it back down to lay down the Kaibab. Uh, they have a model, but I think it's unrealistic to have such flat layers and all that activity. I think it's a good point. <clears throat> on a recent geological field trip, we were sitting amongst those red rocks just out west of Denver, uh, and we were told that the Rocky Mountains that we were looking at were the second set, that a prior set that had risen up had since eroded away, and now we were looking at the second set. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me why a geologist would say that? What's the evidence for his theory? Well, they probably find some evidence of layers going up and they've been flattened, washed out. So that's the first set. Then you have another set on top. That would be the second set. And, uh, but you can wipe out stuff during the flood. I don't see that as any challenge to a flood model. Uh, but let me stay. I, I was not there. I'm not sure of the details. I, I can't tell you, but no, I, I can. I can fit that into uh, that data into either model quite, really, quite readily. If you're going to erode away the Rocky Mountains, maybe that's where you get some of your flat sediment. Well, you know, uh, you have a worldwide event mm -hmm. like the flood. You're going to have uh, at least sometimes. You're going to have some rather severe uh, activity. Other times, I mean, the thing took a year. You know. You have all kinds of depositional environments. Some parts may have been elevated and dry, even. Uh, there is a, one of the um, evolutionary criticisms of this book here. Uh, this is a, a creationist book, Grand Canyon. Uh, uh, it's called A Different View, and so on. Uh, mentions, you know, what are you going to do? You've got dr uh, ripple marks? I mean, I'm sorry, I, I can't see what the problem of ripple marks during a flood. Uh, they're made by flowing water. Uh, raindrops? Okay, maybe there was some rain during the flood. Uh, you know, it's, uh, what happens is that these people make these pronouncements and uh, you know, there's a statement that says, never trust a scientist in front of a television camera. And, uh, I need to be careful what I say here. Yeah. Uh, How did you know there were two sets of mountains? Uh, oh, yeah, on Cabrera Lift, and then you had, this is a lot more than that. I mean, you can have all kinds of things going on. This is, this is very easy to do. Uh, uh, but the flood was a very complex thing, no question. If it's worldwide, it had to be very complex. And if you're going to get the water or the continents down to get the water over them, per se, and so on, you're going to have a lot of tectonic activity that would do things. So uh, these are not challenges, I would say, to, to the flood model. The challenge is to know really what really happened. So uh, take your choice. The uh, depositional mechanics uh, for a large area there, uh, it is impossible to think that a river could uh, spread these particles out in, in their density and, and particle size over such a large area uh, using that mechanism. It's such a flat area. Yes. Uh, keep in mind, the, uh, uh, we're, we're talking uh, the most river, uh, riverish layer Sorts. There is the uh, Hermit Shale. 
it is thicker in the western part of the Grand Union than in the east, but man, it goes all the way down to Sedona, all the places, 30,000 square miles of it. Uh, no, I, I have very serious problems in such with virtually no topography. This is what really bothers me. Virtually no topography, uh, and, and you, you go up in the layers above this. You know, the, the, uh, go to the uh, um, oh, right above the um, bottom of the by the Chin Li, the uh, Chenier conglomerate. I mean, hundred thousand square miles of a conglomerate. You know, I, I have a very hard time spreading that one out of the flood model. It, and, it, then, and then the, the, the Dakota, 315,000 square miles. I mean, it runs clear from Midwest to, to Arizona. Uh, uh, now, there's strong data that supports the biblical model. Well, the, the sorting alone uh, over that large area would require water uh, having tremendous amount of uh, energy involved with it to suspend those particles, mm -hmm. and then that energy would have to be dissipated very quickly to be able to sort the material yeah. that that comes out of there. And and rivers just don't act that way. It doesn't fit our normal model very easily. No, I don't think. Um, if if I can ask, uh, what is the largest river delta that we have in the world right now? Boy. I don't know. Uh, the Amazon, maybe? Nile. Nile. Uh, and so on. Uh, it, uh, Which is how far across? I don't know. I, I don't know offhand. But, but I, 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 uh, comparing that with some of the layers that we're talking about, it seems like it's a, uh, just a bit smaller. Yeah. Yeah. What, what type of uh, dating methodologies have been used on these later layers, uh, radiometric or otherwise, and what were the results of those studies? All kinds have been used. I mean, there are thousands of dates on the Grand Canyon radiometric dates. Uh, almost all of them are older than 4,000 years. The, the one date they get is out of these uh, split stick figurines the Indians have left in some of these caves, okay? This just gives you a, uh, a minimum date. And they get 3,000, 4,000 years carbon-14 dating. That's in an area of carbon-14 uh, we think is probably more trustworthy. Uh, but the other stuff, they've got so many. We're going to talk about six different models that the uh, traditional geologists have for the cutting the Grand Canyon. Uh, and their model affects what dates they expect or what expect dates they trust. Uh, the dates are not, uh, I wouldn't say they were all pure scatter, uh, but uh, you need to be careful. Uh, you know, what just happened two weeks ago is that uh, article came out in Science, and uh, Flores, I think it was, uh, uh, they had dated the Western Grand Canyon, okay? They did the Western Grand Canyon, they used a, a complex system of uh, uranium, helium, and thorium. And they think they can authenticate the zircon uh, temperature and so on through this and so on. And they come out and they say, hey, the Western Grand Canyon is 70 million years old. Now, this is a shock to all the traditional scientists. Now, we've been working the last 10 years or so. They think, oh, no, the canyon, canyon's only five to six million years old. And, uh, but there have been dates before in that region. There have been some dates in the 40 million years. There have been some dates in the... 17, 18 million years on, on uh, speleothems uh, in these caves and so on. Uh, they come up with, uh, and it depends on to a certain extent what model you want for that Grand Canyon as to whether those dates will fit with that particular model. Uh, I think some other factors affect these dates. Uh, 
but uh, one doesn't have a shortage of variability in dates in the Grand Canyon in terms of, I mean, they, they go from one, some dates, you know, almost 100,000 years. It's a little 100,000 years. And some of these methods, they, they'll give you 100,000 years. Uh, so uh, you don't have any shortage of variability, but please don't use these without knowing what you're talking about. Uh, because to a certain extent, they do get a certain consistency. I, I think other factors affected that. Uh, and, and, uh, so so keep, in, re in relation to, to dating the layers specifically, do we see a, a great disparity in dating between the top layers and the bottom layers, or is it just inconsistent? Is the data inconsistent? Uh, you see, you can't date these very well, easily, by any good methods. These are sedimentary layers. And it used to be glauconite dating and so on. That's not trusted very much. Uh, or you have intrusion volcanic activity. Uh, you got And uh, around the volcanoes area, they've dated that. And boy, they've been changing their minds quite a bit about what uh, date you would give there, uh, per se. Uh, in terms of uh, where they find things, they get to a certain amount. They can get some consistency in their model. They can get that. Uh, and I think probably some other factors were, but folks, I have absolutely no way to explain those widespread gaps, no erosion uh, in terms of their model. Uh, there must be something wrong there. There must be something wrong there. There is that data that severely challenges those long ages. Okay, well, I think uh, we you folks have a good here. Sabbath. <clears throat> oh, were you going to ask a question? What's the deepest layer they have found carbon-14 in? What's that? What? What? What's the? Uh, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, these are just caves in the red wall. So there could have been contamination. In well, the the, the uh, Indians lived there. They made these figurines out of they, they did it. 4,000 years ago. It's all post-depositional. It's a minimum date, of course. For the, but it tells you the canyon has not changed very much in the last 4,000 years. Uh, which, you know, that's no problem. The receding waters of the flood washed out the, the, the canyon, and it's there. Uh, it erodes away a little bit slowly now, but not very much. Yeah. There. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for for an um, ignorant <laughs> like me, is oh. the Grand Canyon the product of uh, rapid cavitation, where the emptying over 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 a big body of water has progressively ripped through the existing strata at that time, or is it just a tectonic event where? crust has split and then we see all the strata there. Well, you have both models are being suggested by some people. Uh, some want a catastrophic model. We, we'll talk about that next week. Some talk about catastrophic model where there were lakes on the, on the uh, eastern side and those lakes washed through. There's not enough water to do it, but anyway, it, it, uh, it's one of the models. Uh, and they talk, well, maybe slowly the river did this, and others say, no, the river couldn't have done any of that. Uh, it's scarp retreat. Scarp retreat is where uh, uh, the sides wear down very slowly type of thing. Uh, you have trouble with scarp retreat when you have some of these large areas like the Esplanade. Uh, flat area and so on, because you have great big scarps. Of it. Where did all that stuff go? Uh, it's not going to be done by, washed away by, by, little, by raindrops. It's going to take major activity to wash that out. So that particular model doesn't work that well and so on. But, uh, so, you know, there's all kinds of ideas out there. 
but uh, uh, I think probably, uh, <coughs> well, next week I'll tell you. I, no, I think I probably is washed out by major. Washed out. Um, now, my question was this material that was brought, was removed from the Grand Canyon, was mm -hmm. deposited somewhere in California, right? Somewhere in between. The Maybe in the Pacific Ocean? Oh, okay. Oh. But not in strata. Is it deposited in strata? Is it has been removed progressively down, or is just a mixture of everything? Uh, there's just a little of it in the Boos formation, uh, Imperial formation in California, and so on, supposed to have come from the Grand Canyon. Uh, but this is not going to take care of, uh, let me warn you folks, uh, the Grand Canyon is peanuts. You've got two miles of stuff over 15,000 square miles to remove above the Grand Canyon before you get to the top of the Grand Canyon. Okay? Uh, carving the Grand Canyon, that's not such a problem. How are you going to get rid of all this other stuff? It's a real problem. Do you have today's presentation in print anywhere? No. I wrote an article on it. It's in John Baldwin's book on uh, uh, or Calvary, creation, and uh, catastrophe. Uh, that you'll find some of that in there. But this has been recorded, you know, and it, it's out there on the net. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's available, it'll be available in a few hours. As you know, the Australians have a large canyon in the Blue Mountains. They mm -hmm. say it's bigger and older than ours, of course. If you removed all the verdure, all the trees there, would you have the same stratas as you have in the Grand Canyon? No, no. Uh, you know, that, these are limited. Uh, there is some generality between these. They, they give them different names, different places. It's uh, too bad, but there, there is that problem. For instance, you've heard of the Navajo sandstone in Zion. Uh, you, you go across the state line to Nevada, they call it the Aztec sandstone. And then you go across and up to Wyoming, they call it the Nugget sandstone. It's all the same unit. Are they the same ones there? No, but there are some similarities. Uh, in general, most of your lower layers tend to be marine. Uh, you have reddish layers in the middle. You have fine marine material towards the top. I'm speaking of the geodite column here, uh, in general, towards the top and so on. So there are some generalities, but uh, uh, you'll find different names, different continents. I'm not concerned about names. I'm concerned about strata. Is it the, is it the same layer, per se? Uh, you have to go, go look at it and study it to make sure. Uh, I mentioned uh, the red wall here in the Grand Canyon. Okay. You go up in the Wyoming, you have the Madison limestone, exactly the same place. It's got a red layer on top of it, just like the red wall, uh, per se, uh, and so on. And uh, it's considered equivalent, but you don't find a continuity between the red wall in northern Arizona and the Madison in, in Wyoming. And the other formation you mentioned that was much deeper than the Grand Canyon, is this Precambrian? Uh, no. You, you mentioned know, in Asia, in the, uh, in the Himalayas or someplace. You mentioned oh, that, that. that's just a canyon. Okay, it's mostly Precambrian stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, there's no showcase like the Grand Canyon where you see all those layers. Like, hey, man, this is, couldn't ask for a better show of those layers than you have there. If I can ask a couple of questions, one of, one of them being, uh, there have been some dates that have been, uh, apparently, among other things, uh, the fellows at ICR uh, showing <coughs> rubidium strontium dates uh, on lava that flowed over into the Grand Canyon. <coughs> and, uh, 
something in the neighborhood of 1.05 billion years or so. Right. So <laughs> I think most people will agree that the candy is not actually 1.05 billion years old. This is lava that's on top and flow down into the canyon, you see, but uh, yeah, you, uh, different dating techniques and procedures give you different dates, per se. Uh, and so uh, I appreciate that, uh, but know what you're talking about before you uh, say too much. The other, the other question has to do with uh, some of the conglomerates you were mentioning that had plants. Uh, a scholar here who prefers not to be named, uh, who was talking about uh, uh, the amount of those kind of things in suspension. And the figure that sticks in my mind is that most conglomerates don't flow, don't form until your water is flowing somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, does that have anything to say about uh, <coughs> how you make a layer that has centimeter size? That runs for 50 uh, miles. Uh, yes, if you are going to transport those in that distance. Now, keep in mind that in the uh, geological literature there are intraformational conglomerates forming right now in the sea and they would say well no these they these were not transported there these formed there over millions of years so th their model has some plausible answer for that for intraformational conglomerates where i just completely run into trouble is uh, large conglomerates. Uh, we have like, like the uh, Shinarib conglomerate, spread over 100,000 square miles. Uh, <coughs> uh, you've got to have a source. This is, this is rock, this is sand, it's quartz. Uh, had to come in from somewhere. How in the world are you going to get this over 100,000 square miles without some major catas catastrophic thing? I mean, this is, I have no answer but catastrophism for it. How many uh, miles is it, uh, 100 by 100 or whatever square miles? Um, you say 100,000 square miles, if you were to say it's 10 by 10, it's 100 by 100, or it's 1,000 by 1,000. What is 100,000 square miles? Pardon my math. Oh, the square root of 100,000? It would be about 300. So it's uh, you know 200 by 500, or 300 by 300. Uh, I think 3.16 3 or something Three. like that. But it's in that range. Oh. Okay. Yeah. You, OK. 300 miles, your square root. Yeah. OK, Joanne. <clears throat> Maybe off the subject, <clears throat> are the people who study genetics coming up with anything that shows that there was a catastrophe and that the genes only date from a certain mm -hmm. date like Noah? I don't the know. geneticists? I don't know offhand. Have you heard of anything lately on that one? Paul? Um, <clears throat> uh, the question again. Okay. Um, do the geneticists come up with something strange like um, all the genes date back to one person about the time of Noah or oh, something that one, like that? Yeah. No? Um, 
there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of dispute about that because uh, the uh, the answer that was uh, finally come to was considered unbelievable, and so uh, there are people who feel that uh, <coughs> they need to work with the uh, uh, with the genetics somehow to get a more what they consider reasonable answer. But that's that's a whole different uh, topic, and uh, in order to do it justice, I think we had we had one uh, uh, whole uh, sixty minute. Uh, discussion on that at one point, uh, and it should be archived if you're interested in it. Uh, I think we have that uh, in the in the website. You know, going back further, uh, uh, we'll have to we'll have to revisit that again sometime. The figure it did come out six thousand years in the literature, uh, and of course everybody. I believe you could have grabbed onto it like that and so on. And it was quickly destroyed. Uh, you're dealing with historical science, and um, it's not as good as experimental science. There was the joke about people putting their hand in a box where they couldn't see it, and one says, I feel this, and I feel that, and I feel that. So we're reaching back into the past, trying yeah. to, yeah. Okay, well, you folks have a good Sabbath. So come on back next week and we'll discuss how the canyon was cut. <laughs>